together. We were studying in, in chapter 20, Acts chapter 20, and Paul was meeting with all these churches that he had planted in his second missionary journey. He was on his third missionary journey. So he spent some time, we saw last time in Greece and Macedonia. And lastly, he met with uh, the people from the church at Ephesus, the elders from the church at Ephesus. Uh, he met them just south of Ephesus, as it were, south of Asia there, the province of Asia. And in those last verses then of chapter 20 are Paul's exhortations to those elders of that church, starting at verse 17. You can see that in your Bible. And I think there's a lot for us to consider also. So we kind of went by it kind of fast last time we were together. And I wanted to come back to that today, come back to those verses and get a look at Paul's thoughts on this thing we call the church and see some thoughts he has in there about the church here in Acts chapter 20. And the first point of my outline is church ownership. Church ownership. So let me read verse 28, Acts 20, 28. says, Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God, which He purchased with His own blood. And so, you know, a question that enters the minds of many when they enter a church building today is who owns that building, right? When they come in there, is the church renting? Does the church have a mortgage? Does the church own it outright? These are kind of questions we have today. It used to be always the church that owned it, of course. That's always the way it was. But it's not always that way today. For instance, we're renting this building, right? We rent. We don't own this building. And so we wonder about such things. But we know the church really is not a building, right? The church is not a building. The church is the people, the people are the actual church. But as people, there's one who owns us too, as it were, according to the Bible. There's one that owns us. It's not a pastor or a denomination. It's the Lord Himself. The Lord is the one who owns us. As verse 28 says, He purchased us with His own blood. Now, someone might say that sounds a little odd. Are you saying people are for sale, right? That sounds a little strange to our ears. What does it mean that Jesus purchased us? Well, the Bible declares that everyone is born really into a form of slavery, not even knowing it. In fact, we will always serve someone or something in this life. That's just sort of the way that we're made. We're never going to be just sort of this independent own master of our own destiny. We're always going to ultimately serve someone. The question is, who are we going to serve? Romans chapter 6 discusses this at Romans 6, starting at verse 20. It says, Romans 6, 20, For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. Therefore, what benefit were you then deriving from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the outcome of those things is death. But now, having been freed from sin and enslaved to God, you derive your benefit, resulting in sanctification, and the outcome, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so Romans 6 shows us that sin formerly reigned over us. That was what ruled over our lives. But Jesus purchased us with His own blood to free us from that. Now, when we think about you know, just how we go about our, our lives, our, our business and our lives and so forth, what we're willing to give in exchange for something speaks of the value of that thing to us, doesn't it? I mean, we spend thousands of dollars to own cars, right, for transportation. But if lunch costs us more than $10, we take notice, right? We're like, hey, that was pretty expensive for lunch, right? <laughs> we notice that right away. No one wants to spend the price of a car on lunch, right? No one wants to do that. If you want to do that, I want to go to lunch with you. But no one wants to do that, right? No one wants to spend thousands of dollars on lunch. Well, why is that? Well, we recognize there's a, a value to these things, right? I mean, the value of transportation is, is much higher than a meal, well, how infinitely valuable are we to God that Christ gave His own life? Think about that. What could be more valuable than the life of the Son of God Himself? I mean, nothing comes close to that. Nothing's anywhere in that range at all. Yet that was the price Jesus laid down to save us. Let that sink in a little bit. Think about what that says about your value to God. And let that change then how we look at our lives, right? That should change how we look at our lives and how we, how we want to live them now for Christ. Jesus gave His holy life for us, so we want to live our lives now for Him in response to that. 
And so we're talking about church ownership. Who owns the church? Well, it's Jesus. Jesus bought the church. He bought us with His own blood. But Jesus needs some hands and feet to watch over the church. And Paul addresses that also here in verse 28. Uh, he says there, I'll read it again, Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God. And so this is, we're talking about church leadership is our next point. And remember, he's talking to these elders of the church of Ephesus. He's addressing them. And although there are different models of church leadership that you can find out there, different churches you know, run their leadership a little bit differently, uh, the elder or overseer, as it's called here, is universally recognized. Everyone recognizes that position in the church. It's so clearly defined. Paul defines this role in more depth in 1 Timothy. I'll read from 1 Timothy 3. Starting at verse 2, 1 Timothy 3, 2, says, An overseer then must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, temperate, prudent, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not addicted to wine or pugnacious, but gentle, peaceable, free from the love of money. He must be one who manages his own household well, keeping his children under control with all dignity. But if a man does not know how to manage his own household, how will he take care of the church of God? And not a new convert, so he will not become conceited and fall into the condemnation incurred by the devil. And he must have a good reputation with those outside the church, so he will not fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. So I'm not going to go into depth with all these you know, verses here in, in 1 Timothy, but just to give a, a picture of, of what it says there and to kind of summarize it. I might summarize it this way, that an elder exhibits godliness in their character and behavior. Right? We expect that. We expect that of every believer, that there's godliness in our character and behavior. The elder then is a reliable source of wisdom. And the elder is a mature Christian man. I mean, I think that's really kind of you can summarize it in those three ways. But we also remember that an elder is a human being, and so every elder has room to grow in that list, I'm sure. And every elder, like every other believer, takes it one day at a time. You know, we've got to walk in, in uh, dependence on the Lord every day. Here in the book of Acts, Paul focuses on the elder or overseer's role as a shepherd, he says. Now we realize the Scripture describes Jesus as the Good Shepherd of all of us, doesn't it? In John 10, 14, and 15 there, John 10, 14, and 15, Jesus says of Himself, I am the Good Shepherd, and I know my own, and my own know me, even as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. That was from John 10, 14, and 15. So an elder in a church, an overseer in a church, is really an under-shepherd, right? Because Jesus is the real shepherd. He's the good shepherd. And so an elder is just uh, someone that God has uh, given some uh, portion of His flock to care for, right? Sort of an under-shepherd, as we say. We submit to the good shepherd as elders as we seek to minister to the flock that God's entrusted to us. In Acts 20, it points out that God is the one who makes someone an overseer or elder. It said also, he said there that the Holy Spirit had decided, has made you, it says, overseers. And that's no surprise to us because God calls everyone to the ministry positions that they hold. Right? I mean, that's just always the way it is. God is the one who decides what ministry we're going to have. We don't decide that sort of in the flesh sort of thing. And so an elder then is called to that position as an elder, and that calling is then just recognized by the church. We recognize what God is doing, and the church wants to follow that. We recognize the calling of God on this person's life. We follow in that call. Now Paul uses the term overseer, and why does he use that term? Well, it's kind of like he's giving a title here. It's like an office of overseer is what an elder holds. An overseer, though, shouldn't be thought of as a, a micromanager. It almost sounds like that. When you think of overseer, it kind of has a negative connotation in English. Uh, but really it's just someone who's watching over the flock. That's what the elder is doing. Uh, Hebrews 13, 17 speaks of leaders in that way. It says they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. And so that's what an overseer does. They look out for others in the fold, which is really just looking out for the health, you know, the spiritual health of uh, the church. 
In particular, if a threat comes into the fold, you know, a false teacher comes into a body, the elders are going to deal with that, right? They're going to they're say, hey, you can't be teaching that here. And if it continues, that person may not be able to come to the church, right? I mean, in the ultimate extreme, we'll talk about that a little bit more later. Because the elder is a shepherd, like our Lord is our great shepherd, and so an elder is going to have compassion for the flock. They have a vested interest in the flock, right? They care about the flock, like all of us do. We all care about one another, but of course the elder needs to be in that position, and, and they want to see the sheep growing. They want to uh, pray for the sheep, and of course all of us do these things too, but the elder in particular is going to have these burdens. The shepherd then tends to the flock also. We already mentioned they protect from danger. They help in times of trouble. They lead them in safe paths. You think about how Jesus describes, or how, excuse me, in the Old Testament, Psalm 23, talks about the Lord is my shepherd. That's, that's kind of the imagery of it, what an elder is doing as they're you know, being used by the Lord. They're going to be used in some of these various ways too. And shepherds feed the flock. In teaching, shepherds provide spiritual food for the flock. In particular, you know, the pastor-teacher, that spiritual gift, uh, as an elder, an elder has that gift, is going to use that gift, like I'm using it today, uh, to feed the flock, to feed, feed from the Word. And so this is what spiritual leadership of a church looks like, right? The, the overseer, the elder. And as Calvary Chapel, we see the elders as the spiritual leaders in the church. And in addition, we have a board that kind of oversees sort of the business side of the church and provides financial guidance and accountability. You know, that's it's actually involves people in the body, but also outside the body to provide that accountability. But coming back to Acts chapter 20, Paul speaks more about the church. Uh, he talks about the battle that the church is involved in, starting at verse 29. Acts 20, 29 says, I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves, men will arise, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. You know, Satan doesn't want people getting saved, right? Satan is the enemy of our souls. He wants to kill, steal, and destroy. And so he attacks the church, right? I mean, go after the church. I mean, that's God's hands and feet. He's using it in the world. So try and knock it down. You know, try and prevent it from being effective. Satan uh, works uh, double time on that. And so it tells us in verse 29 that as part of that, there are these threats that come from without side the church. These threats from without that Paul knew was going to happen, that these false teachers would descend upon the churches. We see that that happens as we go forward in the New Testament. Uh, he's already dealt in the book of Acts a little bit with the Judaizers. That was one of the primary uh, trouble uh, groups uh, in the New Testament era. Uh, these were professing Jewish believers who taught that Gentile, Gentiles need to become like the Jews in lifestyle and ritual to be saved. Basically, they wanted to take the church and put it back under the law. That's what they were trying to do. They said, no, you've got to keep the law if you want to be a good Christian. And so those were some false teachers in their day. And we continue, though, to have false teachers in our day. Now, there are kind of some variants of Judaizers actually out there nowadays, too. You may have talked to someone who's fallen into that tragically. But these pose as believers, but they teach things that are not consistent with the Bible. But they teach things that are not uh, in line with the Gospel. They seek followers for themselves. They want to exploit the, vo the vulnerable. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, uh, starting at verse 6, it talks about false teachers there. It says, For among them are those who enter into households and captivate weak women weighed down with sins, led on by various impulses, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Just as Janus and Jambers opposed Moses, so these men also opposed the truth. Men of depraved mind rejected in regard to the faith. And so, you know, a false teacher is not a shepherd who's looking out for the sheep. A false teacher is a wolf that's seeking to devour sheep. That's what a false teacher is. And so, uh, very uh, dangerous, you know, individuals that are trying to, you know, really cause trouble for the body of Christ. 
Paul says these, these uh, church will have these threats from outside, but also have threats from within, he says in verse 30. And that's perhaps the most difficult dynamic we have to deal with in church life. Not necessarily in this church here I'm looking at, but just in the church. When you think about the church uh, universally. It's so hard for us to fathom that someone who once seemed so right with God uh, can turn out so wrong. You know, and we see that happen, tragically. If you've walked with Christ more than maybe a decade, especially if you've stayed in the same community, you've probably seen it happen. You've probably seen somebody that something went crazy and now they're way out here in left field. They begin espousing things that are clearly unbiblical. There's a perversity of doctrine coming out of their mouths, perhaps, and then just in other ways that they're living and talking, you realize, wow, this person is really no longer where they used to be. I don't know what happened here. And that's the question. What happened to these people? Right? We, don't, we don't quite fully understand what happened to them. Some, maybe they backslid. right? Maybe they're, they're backslidden. When a believer falls into sin, which can happen, the Lord has laid out for us a procedure for correcting them. I mentioned, I sort of referenced that earlier in Matthew 18, starting at verse 15. Matthew 18, 15, Jesus says, If your brother sins, go and show him his fault in private. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. But if he does not listen to you, take one or two more with you, so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. And so, the unrepentant one, Jesus says, you know, they've, they've gone through that whole process, right? You met with them, you took someone else with you, then they brought from the whole church, and they just refused to repent over what's an obvious area of sin in their lives. And he says, well, then just treat them like a tax collector or a Gentile. Basically means an unbeliever. You know, treat them like an unbeliever. And that does not mean that we dislike this person, that we shun them, that we have all these you know, negative emotions towards them. It's not talking about that at all. It means that we treat them like they're lost. This is someone we're going to be praying for. You know, that we pray that they get right with God. Now, obviously, they may have to, you know, disfellowship from the church for a while until they can get that right. You know, if they're unwilling to repent and they're trying to lead others into that, that may be necessary. But the whole point of it is not that someone wants to be pushed out. We want someone to be restored. That's the whole point of it, for them to be restored. In fact, when we look at 2 Corinthians chapter 2, uh, we see that there was such an incident of discipline that took place, and it worked. The man repented. He was restored. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 6, uh, again from the Apostle Paul, he says, Sufficient for such a one is this punishment which was inflicted by the majority. So that on the contrary, you should rather forgive and comfort him. Otherwise, such a one might be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. Wherefore, I urge you to reaffirm your love for him. And so the discipline did exactly what it was supposed to do. It was successful. The person came to their senses and realized, what am I doing? You know, and they repented, and now they want to come back in the church. Of course, you know, want them back uh, in the fellowship. He's saying, welcome them back. But sometimes others show that they really never were believers. The, the Bible says that too in 1 John chapter 2, verse 19. I realize I'm giving you a lot of Scripture today. Hopefully they're not overwhelming you. But 1 John chapter 2, 19 says, They went out from us, but they were not really of us. For if they had been of us, they would have remained with us. But they went out, so it would be shown that they all are not of us. You know, like the seed that was planted among the rocky soil that Jesus talked about in Luke chapter 8, it sort of shot up and then it had no root, right? And whatever belief they had in Jesus just sort of withered and died is what happened. Now, is someone in this category, or are they backslidden? You know, we don't really know, do we? I mean, that's, that's a difficult call. I'm glad I don't have to make that call to understand exactly where someone is. In either case, I just know we pray for them. That's what we need to be doing is pray for them. But we also don't give them the same, you know, rights as a believer in our lives that we, as we would have once done. For example, the Scripture says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, uh, verse 14, and this verse will be f probably familiar to you. It says, Do not be bound together with unbelievers. For what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? 
And we, we always apply this verse to marriage, right? It says, you know, don't be unequally yoked, you know, not to get married to an unbeliever if you're a believer. But uh, it, it has a much broader scope than that. It's talking about any really close relationship. We should not be bound together with someone who is, you know, an unbeliever. Uh, for example, we wouldn't want to go into a business partnership with a partner who is an unbeliever and we're a believer. That's not going to work out real good because we have such a different view of the world. You know, it's not really going to, we're going to want to take the business in different directions sort of thing. Or if you have an accountability partner, which is an awesome thing to do, or just close trusted friends, you want to make those, you know, believers so that you're not being guided in a direction away from the Lord by this close relationship is the concern there. In light of all these risks, though, Paul gives us uh, an exhortation now to diligence in verse 31. Verse 31 says, Therefore be on the alert. Remember that night and day for a period of three years I did not cease to admonish each one with tears. We discussed this in our last study, that this, the intensity of Paul's warning here, right? The idea is this picture is that he's pleading to the point of tears in his eyes with them. You know, that's intense. What sort of diligence is Paul calling for? Well, Paul's exhortation, I think, to Timothy as a Bible teacher, I think that applies to everyone. I think that's what he has in mind here. In 1 Timothy 4.16, it says, pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching. Persevere in these things. And so pay close attention to yourself, meaning we need to watch how we're living. You know, what am I doing? What are the things I'm involved in? Why am I involved in these things? Right? We have three enemies in our spiritual lives. We have the world around us that's you know, leading us towards sin, that rebels against God, the world system as it were. We have our flesh that tends towards the sin, the sin nature. And we have the devil who works against us actively, and of course the demons as well. They all tempt us away from the Lord and from living in the right way. And so we need to be deliberate in watching over our lives, don't we? We need to look out over our own lives, responding to the conviction of the Holy Spirit as it comes when we misstep and that sort of thing. Uh, seeking out accountability with others in the body of Christ. You know, if you're a single person, someone else of your gender, if you're married, it could be someone else of your gender. It could just be your spouse, but someone has an accountability partner that you, that you talk with about things in your life. I think your spouse should always be in that list. And then doing just some honest self-reflection also of ourselves. You know, like, what's going on in my life? You know, why, why, am I, why am I doing this different than I used to do? Or why am I thinking this different than I used to think? And see, does that still line up with God's Word? And in all these things, staying humble and correctable. You know, always being humble and correctable by the Lord. If you think about it this way, uh, whenever we see a true work of art, we know it required a lot of effort. Right for that work of art to be produced. And so if our life is going to be the beautiful offering to God that we want it to be, there's going to be some effort involved, isn't there? There's going to be effort on our part involved. There's going to be diligence. Now, we're saved by grace, right? So let's not be confused on that. But in order for us to stay as obedient Christians, there's a lot of choices we have to make there. We have to make the right choices, right? That's that diligence. We need to make the right choices to stay walking with the Lord and not, you know, follow after the things of the world. We also need to watch what we're believing, it says in 1 Timothy 4, your teaching, he said. Many jobs today have the concept of continuing education. Maybe your field is that way. You have continuing education. The idea is that you need these refreshers every few years so that uh, you don't forget what you've learned in times past. And maybe you haven't had to use it on the job in a long time, but you need to keep it fresh. You know, so you have this continuing ed. Now, if that's necessary for our jobs, how much more for our grasp on Christian doctrine? Is it important that we have this sort of continuing education going on in our lives? We need to have those sort of doctrinal refreshers, you know, in our lives, at times in our lives, maybe every year. Now, attending a Bible teaching church like ours does a lot for that, right? That really helps a lot because we're going to teach, you know, Bible doctrine here. We're going to take you through uh, the Word of God verse by verse, and you're going to get those things. But it's also good to spend some time just in personal study. Uh, maybe even curling up with a book that helps you as a new believer and rereading it, you know, and, and just seeing wow, God used this in my life back then and just refreshing yourself on those things. 
you know, when we don't exercise a muscle, it gets weak, right? We notice that physically, you know, if you've, if you've been sick or something and not able to uh, get up out of bed like you normally would, you realize you're a little bit weaker when you finally are uh, restored to your, your full health. Well, when we don't remind ourselves of the essentials of our faith, we tend to get foggy on them too. We get a little weak in our, our grasp of what the foundations of our faith are, the essentials. So we need to remind ourselves of these things. Now, we've been speaking a lot about, you know, the battle and kind of gloom and doom here, you know, in these verses. But Paul's thoughts on the church are going to end on a high note because he comes now to the destiny of the church. That's our final point here is the church's destiny in verse 32. He says, And now I commend you to God and to the word of His grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. And so as we think about the destiny of the church, the first thing I see here that he says is he commends us to God. We're in God's hands, ultimately is what he's saying. When it says commend there in the, in the Greek, the original language, it says to put our place near. He's like, I'm putting you with God. You know, that's a great place to be, isn't it? I want to be with God. He's saying, I put you with God. And isn't that a great comfort for us to know as believers today that our lives are in God's hands? That's where our lives actually are. They're not in the hands of our bosses, of government leaders, others in authority in our lives. They don't have the final say over our lives. God does. God is the one who has that final say. And we can always trust in God, this holy being, who will always do what's right. He always does what's right. Even the best of us in this life have our slip-ups. You know, we make mistakes, we have poor decisions, that sort of thing. But God never does, right? He never makes a mistake. It's impossible for Him to make a mistake. He is perfect. And that's so awesome to know. I mean, who, who more would you want to trust your life to than someone who's perfect, right? I mean, and that is God. He is perfect. And what's more, Paul says, we are under His grace. He says He commends us to the word of His grace. As believers, we're saved by the grace of God. If you think about it, Christianity is the only faith that can really take someone to heaven. If you study other religions, every other faith system depends on human effort. It depends on our own efforts to get there. And we've already said none of us are perfect. We've all lived that out. We all know that. None of us are perfect. And yet no sin can be in God's sight. And so if interest to heaven depends on us, we're doomed. We would never make it. Never in a thousand years. But the message of the gospel is that it's not about you. It's not about me. It's about Jesus. His works are able to take us to heaven. In 1 Peter 3.18, it reminds us of this. 1 Peter 3.18 says, For Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, so that He might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. And so Paul commends us to the grace of God. He puts us into the grace of God. What a comforting thought that is today. But God's plans for us are so much more than just a ticket to heaven. In His grace, it says He builds us up. There in our verses here in Acts 20:32, it says, "Build you up." He brings spiritual growth through His grace in our lives. God changes us as we walk with Him. Aren't you glad that God uh, doesn't leave us the way He found us, you know, whenever He got saved? He doesn't leave us like that. Praise His name. You know, we'd be acting out in the flesh toward one another all the time, consumed with selfishness, just having blatant sin all over our lives. Who would want to live like that? I would not want to be there. God is changing us. He's making us more like Jesus. Theologians call this sanctification. It's that process that starts at salvation and ends when we're in heaven. The sanctification process. And that is the final point here we have, is that God's grace takes us to heaven. It also says in verse 32 that He gives us the inheritance. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, it, it talks more about this inheritance. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. 
I love verse 4 there. I mean, it's such definite language God uses, right? What more could He say? It's imperishable, it's undefiled, it won't fade away, it's reserved in heaven for you. It's like, you got it, okay? <laughs> this is yours, right? I mean, what more could He say there? It's awesome. It's much like what Jesus said in the Gospels in John 14, uh, verses 2 and 3. Jesus said at John 14, In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And so if you're a believer today, Jesus has a place for you already. Don't we look forward to living in those homes with the Lord? That's going to be so wonderful. And if anyone hearing this doesn't have that home, it can be yours today through Christ's sacrifice for you. Let's close with prayer. Lord God, thank you for giving us the church. Thank you, Lord, for this invention of yours, the church that you've created. And just all the, the beauty that's there as, as there's the body ministry that takes place, as the church really are your hands and feet, and the elders being the leaders in that, in that environment, but really all of us are ministering to one another. Thank you, Lord, for all the definite things you say about our eternity, the ways that you're remaking us, you're making us more like Jesus uh, every day as we submit to the work of the Holy Spirit. And that you have that inheritance for us, those homes for us that no one can take away. Lord, no one in this life, no one in, in the afterlife. We have those places you've given to us as your children. Thank you, Lord. We worship you for that. We don't deserve that. We just worship you for giving us that by your grace. And we pray for anyone who doesn't know that, anyone who hasn't received of your grace. We pray as they hear this message that they would respond uh, to your Holy Spirit that they would want to have a place in heaven with you, that they would repent of their sin and turn to you for the new life that you offer. And we pray that they would just be born again, even as they, they say that prayer. We trust that in your hands. In Jesus' name, amen.